Hi everyone, in this video we are going to look at the historical evidence for Jesus. Uh, the, uh, the, the Lord Jesus Christ is the central figure in the Christian faith and we believe that he existed as a person and that certain events happened in his life. So it's important to ask what is the historical evidence for the existence of Jesus Christ and the events that Christians believe happened to him. Uh, let's first look at the background. Uh, Jesus Christ has four biographies written about him in the New Testament, that is in the Bible. So these are also known as Gospels. Uh, they are named after their authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, apart from that, the New Testament contains a book called the Acts of the Apostles, which describes the activities of the original followers of Jesus shortly after his death. And then we have epistles, that is letters of instruction that the first followers of the Lord Jesus, who were called as apostles, uh, the letters that they wrote to the new churches. And we have uh, finally in the New Testament, a book called uh, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, in which uh, one of his original followers, the apostle John, uh, narrates a vision that he had of the risen Christ. Now, looking at the New Testament authors, this is a comment made by a secular and atheist historian. He says, if conventional standards of historical textual criticism are applied to the New Testament, we can no more reject Jesus' existence than we can reject the existence of a mass of pagan personages whose reality as historical figures is never questioned. Uh, in other words, uh, if you... Uh, think of history. We believe in the existence of so many people. Uh, we Indians are familiar with the Emperor Ashoka. Um, at a world level, you have people like Alexander the Great. These are people from ancient times about whom historians have written something, and that's why we believe in their existence. Well, if you apply the same standards for Jesus Christ, we have four biographies of him, and they were written by people who were close to him, and uh, this shows that if you uh, accept the historicity of a personality such as Alexander the Great, then you have much more reason to accept that Jesus Christ is historical. Um, another author comments on the Pauline epistles. So he says there are seven Pauline epistles considered by scholarly consens consensus to be genuine. Now in the Bible, there are actually 13 epistles written by Paul. That is, uh, they are claimed to be written by Paul and Christians believe that Paul wrote them. Uh, but secular scholars are convinced only about seven of them. So they say that these seven epistles are considered to be genuine and are dated between AD 50 and 60. And in these uh, epistles, the apostle Paul explains the meaning of the life of Jesus. Okay, Jesus lived and died and, and uh, Christians believe that he rose again from the dead. Paul believed that he rose again from the dead. So Paul is explaining to the early Christians what is the meaning of all this. So obviously he wouldn't be able to do this if Jesus Christ did not exist. So the fact that these Pauline epistles are genuine, the fact that they were written hardly 20 to 30 years after the uh, death of Christ shows that Jesus Christ himself is historical. Apart from that, we have a large body of writers from the second, third, and fourth centuries called the Church Fathers. Uh, there was a council of Church Fathers called the Nicene Council. So the writings are divided into two parts. So this upper image is called the Anti-Nicene Fathers. That means the writings of the Church Fathers or the leaders of the Church uh, that were there before uh, the third century. The Council of Nicaea took place in around AD 320. So before that, all their writings. And then these are the Nicene and post-Nicene fathers in two volumes. That is the, the, the church fathers who wrote after AD 320. So we have this huge body of uh, writers who tell us uh, about the Lord Jesus Christ, about his disciples, and so on. A person who claims that uh, Jesus is a myth uh, would have to explain to us why he thinks 
all these people wrote such huge amounts of material uh, about somebody who did not exist. I mean, these writings are so extensive uh, that uh, if the New Testament were completely destroyed today, the New Testament can be reconstructed completely from the quotations that these church leaders make while writing uh, these materials. So there's a huge volume of stuff about Jesus Christ and his disciples. But these are Christian writers. Let's look at what some of these writers have to say about the authors of the gospel. So uh, there was a, one of the church fathers is named Papias of Hierapolis. He comes, he's from the second century. And uh, he, he writes like this, Matthew wrote the sayings, that is the sayings of Christ in the language of the Hebrews and everyone translated them as he was able. CH stands for church history written by the fourth century historian Eusebius. Then Eusebius himself writes like this, Matthew at first preached to the Hebrews, that is the Jews, that is his own countrymen. And then when he was about to go to other peoples, that is to other countries to preach the gospel to foreign people, he committed his gospel to writing in his native tongue. Uh, another church leader from the second century uh, writes, um, Matthew also issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect, while Peter and Paul were preaching in Rome and laying the foundation of the church. Now, uh, we know that Peter and Paul were executed by Emperor Nero. That is from Tertullian, another of the church fathers. And anyone who has studied Roman history knows that Emperor Nero himself died in the year AD 68, which means when were Paul and Peter preaching in Rome? That would have been before AD 68, which means that Matthew wrote before this time. In other words, Matthew wrote around 30 years or 40 years uh, after AD 30, which is approximately when the Lord Jesus Christ would have died. So uh, our point here is that these writers affirm that Matthew is indeed the eyewitness that he came, claimed to be, the disciple of Christ, and he put to writing all that he had experienced with Christ uh, hardly 30 or 40 years after the death of Christ. Uh, the second gospel is called Mark, and um, uh, Irenaeus of Lyons says that after Peter and Paul's death, Mark, who was the disciple and the translator of Peter, did also hand down to us in writing that which had been preached by Peter. So Mark was not one of the original disciples of Christ, but he was uh, the disciple or he was the assistant and translator of Peter who was one of the original disciples. So in other words, he was associated with an eyewitness and he wrote his gospel. Clement of Alexandria says the same thing. After Peter had preached the word in Rome and he died, then other people uh, requested Mark that he should write an account uh, based on the knowledge that he had from Peter. And so Mark wrote this. So here we see that Mark himself is also an associate of an eyewitness and he is writing shortly after Peter's death, which is AD 68. In other words, around 40 years after the death of Christ. Regarding Luke, the third gospel, uh, Irenaeus in his book Against, his, uh, Against Heresies, he writes like this, Luke also the companion of Paul recorded in a book, the gospel preached by Paul. So as we earlier saw, Paul wrote his epistles in the 50s and the 60s. And he was a preacher of the gospel. And Luke was his companion. And then Luke uh, wrote the gospel, that is the biography of Jesus, which means Luke himself would have been writing in the 60s or the 70s. ANF stands for Antinicene Fathers. Tertullian, another church father from Carthage, that is North Africa, he writes like this, of the apostles, John and Matthew first instilled faith into us while of apostolic men, Luke and Mark renew it afterwards. In other words, Tertullian from AD 200 is affirming that the uh, writers, the biographical authors of Jesus are the same as those traditionally believed among Christians. Eusebius, the church historian from the fourth century, uh, tells us that 
Luke originated from Antioch. Uh, it, that's a city in Syria. And he was a physician by profession. And he was a companion of Paul. So what Eusebius says agrees with what Irenaeus is saying. And then he says, Luke has left for us two inspired books. One of these books is the gospel. That is the gospel of Luke. And then uh, the other is uh, the Acts of the Apostles, which he composed not from the accounts of others, but from what he had seen himself, because he was a companion of Paul and the Apostles. So his gospel, he had to write uh, from his research or his knowledge and acquaintance with eyewitnesses, because he himself was not an eyewitness. But Acts of the Apostles, he writes directly as an eyewitness. So this is about the Gospel of Luke. And then similarly about John, uh, Irenaeus writes like this, that John, the disciple of the Lord, who had leaned upon his breast, did himself publish a gospel during his residence at Ephesus in Asia, that is Turkey. So John was one of the disciples of Christ, and he also is a writer of the gospel. Uh, Jerome from the fourth century wrote a book called On Illustrious Men. And then he writes account of the various apostles. And he claims that when John had written the gospels, uh, when John had read the gospels that Matthew, Mark, and Luke had written, he approved the substance of the history and declared that the things that they said were true. Okay? But he noted that they had focused on one period of Jesus' life. And then Jerome says that John made it a point to relate the events of the earlier period before uh, Jesus' forerunner, that is John the Baptist, was shut up in prison. So you have these three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which focus on certain incidents in the life of Christ. And then you have John, uh, which, uh, who also narrates certain other incidents that took place in the early part of the ministry of the Lord Jesus. So the point that we're making in all these quotes is that the four biographies of the Lord Jesus were written uh, shortly after the time of his birth. The, the three earlier ones, which are called the Synoptic Gospels, were written around 35, 40 years after the death of Christ. And John was written uh, up around 70 years after the death of Christ. This is too early for myths and legends to develop. This is too early for a larger than life persona to develop because at the time of their writing, several eyewitnesses or people who had seen Jesus existed. So it is not possible for them to write uh, fanciful stories. They had to write uh, the things that actually took place. So uh, the historicity of Jesus Christ is proved by the fact that he had four biographers who wrote not centuries later, as is the case with Alexander the Great or other personalities in history, but these are people who wrote just within a generation of the death of Christ. Uh, not only did they um, produce these writings, but they were willing to die uh, rather than deny the things that they had written. So all this is proof of the authenticity of these gospel records, and that in turn proves the historicity of the Lord Jesus. Uh, let's now look at some other people who have reported on Jesus. Josephus was not a Christian, but he was a Jewish historian who lived in the first century. That means uh, shortly after the death of the Lord Jesus. And uh, he has written a book called The Antiquities of the Jews. And this book contains at least uh, two references to the Lord Jesus. This is one of them. So he says, he, that is Ananias, the high priest, he convened a meeting of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, and brought before them a man named James, the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ, and certain others. So here, uh, Josephus is telling us that Jesus' brother and other people who were followers of Christ, uh, they were stoned to death because of, the, of, of following Christ of following teachings that were somewhat different from the traditional Jewish religion. Um, then uh, there is another passage of Josephus, which mentions Christ. Here he says that there was a person called Jesus, a wise man, 
if indeed one ought to call him a man then he he wrought surprising feats he was a teacher of such people who accept the truth gladly and it's josephus says he won over many jews and many of the greeks he was the christ when pilate upon hearing him accused by men of the highest standing among us had condemned him to be crucified those who had in the first place come to love him did not give up their affection for him and then he goes on to say jesus rose again from the dead and appeared to his disciples and the tribe of christians so called after him has still to this day not disappeared so here we find josephus claiming that jesus was a special person a wise man perhaps not just a man and uh, he was a teacher a worker of miracles he won over many people he was crucified by pontius pilate and then he rose again from the dead and his followers continue to this day that is at the time when josephus is writing now admittedly uh, some of the things that josephus mentions are too flattering in the sense uh, he says he was the christ Uh, and one would feel like asking okay josephus so if jesus was the christ why did you not become his follower because josephus as far as we know uh, remained a non christian until his death so he did not accept jesus as messiah so because of uh, uh, this problem um, it is uh, the consensus of scholars is that everything in this text is not genuine in the sense that there could be interpolations Uh, that were inserted later by other people but the consensus of scholars is that um the crux of this passage the fact that there was a person called Jesus who was put to death by Pontius Pilate that is something that Josephus indeed wrote uh, in fact in the uh, passage that i quoted in the previous slide uh, there is no uh, introduction as to who Jesus is and that passage comes after this one so it it indicates that josephus has already introduced for us who jesus is why he is called the christ and so the other passage does not need to introduce who jesus is so that shows that this passage indeed is genuine uh, some of the details of it are perhaps superfluous but the passage itself is genuine and that shows that uh, jesus christ was historical um, a, a secular historian is testifying to his existence there was a first century jewish rabbi called rabbi elizer and uh, he said that um uh, balam looked forth and saw that there was a man born of woman who should rise up and seek to make himself god and cause the whole world to go astray so he is talking about the lord jesus christ here but he considers him to be a villain and so uh, he is basically warning people Uh, give heed that he go not astray after that man for it is written that god is not a man that he should lie and if he says that he is god he is a liar and he will deceive and say that he depart and comes again at the end he says this and he shall not perform so these are basically things that jesus christ said about himself uh he implied that he was god he treated people sometimes as if he was god he accepted worship and he said that he would depart and he would come again for the disciples so here this rabbi this jewish rabbi says that yes there was a person who did all these things but he is a false prophet so again this establishes the historicity of jesus then we have the talmud which is a jewish commentary a rabbinical commentary on the old testament there are a few references to christ in this it says on the eve of passover they hanged yeshua of nazareth and the herald went before him for 40 days saying yeshu of nazareth is going to be stoned in that he had practiced sorcery and beguiled and led astray israel let any one who knows anything in his defense come and plead for him but they found not in his defense and hanged him on the eve of passover so here uh the uh jewish claims in the talmud are agreeing with the biblical record the new testament record that yes jesus christ was uh accused of leading israel astray he uh, was put to death on the eve of the passover the word hanged here is a euphemism for being hanged on the cross that is being crucified 
on the cross. So although there are some things that do not agree with the biblical record, uh, remember Jews rejected Christ, so they accused him of a lot of things. And here uh, we have the mention of 40 days. Now, those things did not actually happen. But uh, the Jews, the rabbis who wrote the Talmud, they were unanimous that, yes, there was a person called Jesus Christ who existed. They believed that he deserved to die. He was put to death rightly, whereas Christians believe that he was put to death uh, on a false accusation, but under the plan of God. Uh, Cornelius Tacitus is one of the greatest Roman historians of all time. And he lived in the late first century AD and he reported about the things that were happening in the Roman Empire at that time. And he says, Nero, that is the emperor, fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians. And Christ, from whom the name had origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. And a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. So Cornelius is certainly not a Christian and certainly not a supporter of Christians. He thinks of the Christian faith as a mischievous uh, superstition and an evil thing. And he believes that Christians do abominations. I mean, these were all misconceptions that the Romans had. But the fact is here, Cornelius knew that there was a group called Christians, followers of Christ, and he was a person who had been crucified during the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Caesar, Caesar and at the hands of Pontius Pilate. This is exactly what the gospel writers also say about Christ. If you know Roman history, then you know that Pontius Pilate ruled Judea. He was the governor uh, for the time between AD 26 and AD 36. So the death of Jesus happened during that window. Uh, based on the biblical chronology, we can narrow it down further to one or two years. Another uh, magistrate that was there in the late first century is named Pliny the Younger. And he is writing to a superior as to how he handles Christians. So he says, I've asked them if they're Christians and if they admit it, I repeat the question a second and a third time with a warning of the punishment waiting there. If, I, if they persist, I order them to be led away for execution. Then he goes on to say that these are people who had regularly met before dawn on a fixed day to chant verses ultimately among themselves in honor of Christ as if to a God. So here is a magistrate, someone who is persecuting Christians. So he mentions that, yes, they, there are people like this. They are followers of a certain person called Christ, and they consider him to be God, which means that the deity of Christ is not uh, an invention that happened in the Middle Ages or a few centuries after Christ. The very first followers in Christ during the first century AD, uh, they believed that he was God and they would sing hymns of praise to him just like you would normally do to God. Lucian was a satirist and uh, uh, he would uh, comment on the things that are happening in Rome. And he mentions Jesus as the man who was crucified in Palestine because he introduced his new cult into the world. Um, uh, Lucian uses the word Palestine because uh, in the late first century after AD 70, the Romans renamed the land of Judea, the land of Israel, the land of the Jews as Palestine. And he says that he persuaded them that they are all brothers one of another after they have all transgressed once for all by denying the Greek gods and worshipping that crucified sophist himself and living under his laws. So Lucian is highly critical of Christians, highly critical of Christ. He misunderstands them as well. Uh, the procedure to become a, a Christian is not just to deny the Greek gods, but that is the impression he had uh, based on the uh, little uh, acquaintance that he had with Christians. So he says that these are people who are worshipping Jesus Christ. That means... There was a person who was crucified whom these people considered 
to be God. Uh, Suetonius, the Roman historian, uh, writes like this, the Jews were continually ma making disturbances at the instigation of Christus, and therefore Claudius, that is the emperor, uh, expelled them from Rome. Now, uh, this agrees with uh, Luke's account in the Acts of the Apostles, where he says that uh, in AD 52, uh, the emperor Claudius expelled Jews from Rome. And here, Suetonius attributes this to the instigation of Christ. So he gets the details a little wrong. The Jews were basically agitating and protesting against the Christians, against the followers of Christ. But he interpreted this way, that it was at the instigation of Christ. But um, what, uh, what Suetonius writes for us here shows that he understood that Jesus Christ was a historical person. Uh, he also agrees with the Tacitus, the historian I quoted earlier, in saying that Nero inflicted punishment on the Christians, who were a class of men uh, given to a new and mischievous superstition. So these are people writing in the first century, and they talk about Jesus and his teachings as real things. They don't approve of them, but they attest to their historical existence. Mara ben Serapoyan was a Stoic philosopher, and one of the letters that he wrote to his sons, this is uh, perhaps shortly after 70 AD, uh, one of these letters is preserved for us. And this is what he says. What, what advantage did the Jews gain by executing their wise king? It was just after that that their kingdom was abolished. So he's referring to the fact that Jesus was crucified around AD 30 or 32, and shortly after that, four decades after that, in AD 70, uh, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the kingdom of the Jews. And, and he says that uh, similar is the case with Socrates. He was put to death, uh, but his teachings lived on. Pythagoras did not, uh, uh, did not die in vain. He lived on in the statue of Hera. And he says the wise king also did not uh, die in vain, but he lived on in the teaching which he had given. We have some indirect quotations. Uh, this is actually written by a person called Justin Martyr, who was a Christian writer, and he is writing a defense of the Christian faith to Antoninus Pius, the second century Roman emperor. And he says like this, the words, they pierced my hands and feet, which are from the Old Testament of the Bible. They are a description of the nails that were fixed in his hands and his feet on the cross. And after he was crucified, those who crucified him cast lots for his garments and divide them, divided them among themselves. And these things were so you may learn from the acts which were recorded under Pontius Pilate. And that he performed these miracles you can easily be satisfied from the acts. So in other words, the Romans kept records of their governors and the experiences they had uh, in their territories. So there was this book called The Acts of Pontius Pilate, which does not has not been preserved till today. But the Christian writer Justin Martyr is telling the emperor of Rome that you can check whether these things are so by looking into the acts of Pontius Pilate. So this shows that in those acts, Jesus' death and the events surrounding that death, which were also prophesied in the Old Testament of the Bible, these were all recorded by Pontius Pilate, the governor who put Jesus Christ to death. The picture here is not of Thelus, but of Julius Africanus. So Julius was a Christian historian, but now he quotes another person called Thelus, a Samaritan non-Christian historian from the first century. And Africanus says that Thales explains away the darkness of Christ's crucifixion as an eclipse of the sun. So then he goes on to say that, you know, a solar eclipse cannot take place at the time of a full moon. And it is known that Jesus died at the time of the full moon. Uh, so here the point is that there is a secular historian called Thales 
who is discussing about the Lord Jesus Christ, and he finds it necessary to explain away the darkness that accompanied Jesus' death as a solar eclipse. So this shows that it was commonly known that there was a person called Jesus, he was crucified, and when he was crucified, there was darkness in that area, as the gospel writers record. Similarly, there is another person called Phlegon, a historian from the second century, but his writings are also not preserved, but we have quotations of those writings by other people. So Philippon says that Phlegon mentioned the eclipse which took place during the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then Julius himself quotes uh, Phlegon and says that he records that in the time of Tiberius Caesar at full moon, there was a full eclipse of the sun from the sixth hour to the ninth. So this is uh, claimed by this historian called Phlegon and Julius is quoting him and saying that what he claims is the same as what Christians believe based on what is written in the gospels. Then here Eusebius, the church historian, again quotes Phlegon saying that there was an eclipse of the sun that happened greater and more excellent that happened before it. At the sixth hour, day turned into dark night so that stars were seen in the sky and an earthquake in Bithynia topped many buildings of the city of Nicaea. The Bible mentions that there was darkness. The Bible mentions that there was an earthquake. Uh, it doesn't say that the stars were seen, but that's what this Phlegon, the secular historian in Rome, is saying about the events accompanying the death of Jesus. And then Origen, who is a Christian writer, and he writes in a book called Against Celsus. Celsus was a skeptic and uh, who was trying to disprove Christianity, and Origen is, Origen is response, uh, responding to him, and he quotes Phlegon saying that, in his 13th or 4th book, he writes of, uh, uh, about Jesus, that he had a knowledge of future events and he could predict them correctly. So here we have these quotations by other writers uh, from uh, uh, quoting Phlegon. And Phlegon, the second century secular historian, is reporting on Jesus. So to, to, to summarize the uh, situation, uh, Graham Stanton, uh, a, a scholar, uh, modern scholars, writes like this. He says, today nearly all historians, whether Christians or not, accept that Jesus existed and the Gospels contain plenty of valuable evidence which is to be weighed and assessed critically. There is general agreement that with the possible exception of Paul, we know far more about Jesus of Nazareth than about any first or century Jewish or pagan religious teacher. In other words, Jesus was historical, and we do know certain things about his life. We know that he was baptized. We know that he had some sort of following among the Jews. We know that the religious leaders in, in Jerusalem opposed him. We know that they handed him to be crucified. We know the name of the governor who crucified him, that is Pontius Pilate. So these are things about Jesus Christ that simply cannot be denied. Uh, Bart Ehrman is an ag agnostic, so he's not uh, certainly not a Christian. He's not writing from a pious point of view, but he says, Jesus certainly existed as virtually every competent scholar of antiquity, Christian or non-Christian, agrees. Note that he is writing this in an anti-Christian book, forged, writing in the name of God. So basically he's writing against Christianity, he does not agree with the things that Christians believe, but he certainly agrees that Jesus was historical. And then he goes on to say, uh, serious historians have spent many years preparing to be experts in the field. And Bart Ehrman himself is an expert. Uh, he says, you need to know Greek and Hebrew and Latin. You need to know Aramaic. That's the language that Jesus spoke. Syriac and Coptic were some of the early languages to which the New Testament was translated. Uh, there is medieval scholarship in German and French and so on. You examine all these manuscripts. You need to have an understanding of the uh, first century history and culture of Greece and Rome, the religions that they had, uh, and so on and so forth. And he said, it is strikingly 
that virtually everyone who has spent all the years needed to attain these qualifications is convinced that Jesus of Nazareth was a historical figure. So uh, no doubt uh, there are uh, wannabe kind of historians today uh, who will uh, make claims. Uh, there is a mythical theory of Jesus that Jesus never existed, but that is not the mainstream historical view. Uh, it is very clear that Jesus Christ lived and he was crucified. Uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, um, pointing to the various ancient historians who mentioned Jesus, says, say that, says that these independent accounts prove that in ancient times, even the opponents of Christianity never doubted the historicity of Jesus. No doubt there were some people who did, but these are again people in the 18th, 19th, and the start of the 20th century. Uh, today, uh, uh, no serious scholar denies the historicity of Jesus. So this is Michael Grant uh, summarizing, the, his, uh, summarizing the scholarly position. So what does this mean uh, for people in general? Uh, you may not be a Christian, so you may not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is uh, a miracle. That is understandable. But on the basis of history, you cannot deny that Jesus Christ lived, that he had developed a following. So maybe he had teaching prowess, maybe he had some other prowess, but he developed a following. Uh, he got into the bad books of the Jewish religious elite. He was condemned to be crucified. And the person who gave that order was Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. Further, you cannot deny that biographies of him appeared within, the, within a few decades of his death. And you cannot further deny that there were many people who were willing to die rather than deny uh, their experience with Jesus Christ. He developed a huge following. He's the most quoted person. Lots more can be said in this, in this light. The fact that he was historical cannot be denied. Okay, he was a historical person, but how is it that he had so much influence? How is it and why is it that he developed such a following even after he was crucified? Why is it that there were people who were claiming that they saw the risen Christ and were willing to die rather than deny that testimony? Uh, this is something that every person has to face and give an answer to. Thank you very much.